Hello and welcome. Welcome to my talk, and talk will be about uh, the power of cloud native uh, in case of financial institution, the power of cloud native architecture, cloud native environment in financial institution where we have the regulated environment. My name is Mateusz Pruchniak. I work, I've worked several years in financial institution, insurance and banking. Uh, <laughs> This is our my agenda today. I split, uh, I split our my talk to two parts. The first part is about the I will introduce you to the world of the regulated environment, and uh, we talk about the definition to be on the same page during this uh, conversation. And the second part will be about the use case of cloud native and in the financial institution, in the banking, insurance is the same, almost the same stuff. All right, uh, I think it's good to start from, to refer the definition of cloud native because it's the first, first talk on KubeCon today after the keynote, it's first day. So to be on the same page, what is mean the cloud native? And I, will, and I will explain, I will comment the definition, the cloud native, cloud native uh, from financial institution perspective, from the bank perspective, uh, from company who uh, has People money, savings, mortgage. So it's very high responsibility we have uh, in the IT department to keep everything secure and to secure and secure using the public cloud. We're talking about almost public cloud. All right. The first paragraph: uh, the cloud native technologies empower organization to build and run scalable application in modern dynamic environments such as public, private, hybrid. It means that. Uh, it means that the cloud native technology is universal for public private hybrid cloud. For us, for, for banking industry, for insurance industry, it's very interesting because thanks to it, we have independent from the types of the cloud, thanks to this technology. Another, the mid, mid paragraph is more about, it's about microservices. Good micro, for me, it's about the microservice architecture. Uh, we, we use the loosely coupled services, uh, systems that are resilient, manageable, and observable. It's about the microservices for me. Uh, the last paragraph is about the, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation seeks to drive adoption of this paradigm by fostering and sustaining ecosystem of open source and vendor neutral. Open source is the nature of the independent. You can uh, for the code, of course, it depends on the license. But you can fork the code, you can extend this code, you can use this code, uh, library tools, and so on. And vendor neutral projects, so it's vendor neutral. So we like the, to be vendor neutral without the vendor locking. This was cloud native definition. Now it's cloud agnostic. What is agnostic? Agnostic IT, it means interoperability. So it means that cloud agnostic system service tools are independent from uh, kind of the kind of the cloud is dependent on uh, public private hybrid and dependent from uh, cloud provider AWS GCP Azure so we build to run system and we can run in every cloud what we want in every cloud what we want uh, some say some experts say that uh, truly the cloud agnostic approach use uh, uses every opportunity to create highly portable system. Other tech experts say things that the cloud agnostic includes the use of multiple cloud simultaneously. Everything is, for me, everything is true. You can use simultaneously or you can migrate from one cloud to another cloud. But this is, the, from my perspective, this is very expensive to build cloud agnostic tools. And we, we lose opportunity uh, to use interesting but specific Cloud features, what we have in the public cloud. Some features of, from the AWS, features from GCP, which are specific and we lose because we need to be cloud agnostic. I think not always we need to be cloud agnostic. So that's why in the real world, I think, I'm sure there will be trade-offs. To summarize, cloud, to summarize, we have this, uh, cloud native is more about Resilience, scalability, using open source, microservices. Cloud agnostic is more about flexibility 
and independent from single cloud provider. We tried to find, during the presentation, I tried to find a common space, but in the cloud native and cloud agnostic. To be cloud native, to be cloud agnostic. And this is the, uh, this is the, this is a slide when I would like to introduce to uh, financial world, a regulator world in European Union, of course. In European Union, we have three authorities. We have ABA, ABA for banking sector, uh, AOPA for insurance sector, and ESMA for rest of the financial institution. Of course, every every country in the European European Union can have uh, can has their own local national authorities. Like in the Poland, we have the Polish Financial Financial Supervision Authority, and all of the authorities they provide guidelines. A lot of guidelines which need to be compliant with them. We need to analyze and we need to take into account during the designing system or designing the migration. This is the most important things. We need to know these guidelines before we design the system to, to run to the public cloud and before we design to migra migra migrate system to the cloud. All right. What we have here, what we have in these guidelines, we have five, five key areas. First is data and system security. Data and system security, in these guidelines, you can find that the, the, the most important things that you, we need to ensure shared responsibility between us and cloud provider. Where is the border? Where is the border? Especially including relation to threat detection, incident management, patch management. Where is the responsibility between our, the client, and the provider, cloud provider? Especially, sometimes it should be on the contract. It should be right in the contract, the, the border between us and them. Uh, there, there, are, I, there, are, uh, there are guidelines for uh, identity access management and guidelines for encryption, encryption data, data encryption. Uh, we always need to encrypt all data, uh, always, always. In transit at rest, we need to encrypt all data by default using uh, cloud provider keys. But if we will keep the legally protected data, for example, uh, personal data, uh, account details, transaction, transaction details, we need to use customer managed keys. We need to use own keys, which we are uh, owner. We need to use our keys, and we need to, and in the guidelines you can find the requirements where where we should keep this, where we have to keep this, uh, the keys. It needs to be hardware protector keys, uh, hardware protector in, in HSM. So for example, in Azure, it's quite easy to achieve because we have uh, Azure Key Vault. We need to choose the premium and create a key, key in HSM, hardware protector key, which we will be using for to encrypt, to ec encryption of our data at rest. Uh, the second, uh, the second, oh, sorry, the second uh, area is about the location of data and data processing. It's easy to achieve because we need to know where our data will be stored and where it will be processing. The data need to be stored and processing in, in Europe, in European Union borders. Uh, I never leave this 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 option, uh, this area. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> this area. Uh, and the third one is risk assessment. I think it's the, the most time-consuming part of everything. We need to analyze, we need to make, we need to make a risk assessment, a risk analysis uh, from several perspectives, from security, business, co business continuity, legal, compliance, oper operational risk, and concentration risk. Concentration risk is the high-level risk. Uh, let's imagine that, uh, we need to avoid situation when all banks from one country, for example, for Poland, will keep uh, we keep our data we keep data in one one region in one one in the one cloud provider. This is not safe situation because the, if the region region go down, we lose almost uh, we lose the the banks banking services. Uh, and the the risk assessment should be performed first before we design the system before we design the migration to the cloud, public cloud. Uh, access and audit rights, financial institution should have rights to access and right, right audit. There's nothing interesting here. 
The last one, exit strategies. We need to have exit plan. It's important to not confuse business continuity management with exit strategies, because uh, BCM is not the same, so what is exit strategy? This exit strategy is long-term process, long-term ex to execute, we need to, uh, we need to uh, can cancel the contract and so on. It's not for, for from a region uh, audit, for example. It's not answer for region audit, exit plan. For short region audit, of course. This is the example of, this example of uh, guidelines for exit strategies. As you can see, uh, here we have information that in case of outsourcing of critical important functions, firms should ensure that it is able to exit cloud outsourcing management without undue disruption to its business. So only for critical important functions. This is quite important. And there is information that we need to be still compliant with obligation and still be secure and, and so on and so on. But there is information that for critical important functions. This is some hat, hat, hat to we need we use on this talk. And this exit plan should be comprehensive, documented, and sufficiently tested and updated during the leaving of our system in the public cloud. This is additional cost which we need to additional maintain 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 maintenance cost which need to be uh, which we have because we need to have exit plan and we need to once a while test the plan. For example, once a year we need to test this plan. Uh, it's important to to make this plan exit plan uh, easy to execute. It's very important because we don't know we don't want to spend weeks weeks preparing infrastructure, preparing the system, and run and test it. That is we can uh, we can execute the exit plan. It needs to be Simple, will be easy to execute and cheap. Ah, and additional things in exit strategy, we have three uh, main uh, exit plans. First exit plan uh, is shut down the system. But if you if you have the important and critical system, critical process functionality, we can shut down. But the second main uh, strategy is to migrate from one cloud provider to another cloud provider. It's okay. And the third one is migrate from cloud provider to on-premise, to private cloud. That's why most of the, mostly of the banks, they use the multi-cloud approach, so they want to have more than one cloud provider and build cloud, uh, private cloud. Because we need to know, we need to, we need to have tools where we can uh, migrate our system from this cloud provider. All right, this is the first part of my talk. About, it's a, more about theoretical in, and introduction to this, my subject. And now we talk about the use case. How we can use the cloud native things, cloud native tools and approach to build system compliant with these guidelines, with the regulation. Of course, we should start from governance. Uh, we should have some governance. We, maybe we should create uh, some team, for example, cl uh, Cloud Center of Excellence, which the team provides the pra best practices. Uh, they, uh, uh, they share the knowledge. They, they promote the op using the open source, promoting the using vendor neutral uh, tools. And the team will help during the risk assessment, will help during creating exit plan. This, this, this not tool, I'm sorry, the team, of course. The team will help during the creating a risk analysis and exit plan. Uh, in a couple of next slides, I will talk about reference architecture, what I imagine of the cloud native and I, I, prom I promote. I will focus only on design and development, not only from design development perspective, but only, but on operation, infrastructure provisioning as well. Uh, but we'll start from the design of the system. Uh, cloud native architecture is microservice architecture, in short words. Yeah? 
clean, good microservice architecture according to best practices, 12 factor, books, some Newman, some Newman books, block Martin Fowler, and so on. And this architecture is built from distributed, as, from distributed set of small services, independent, and the most important, loosely coupled services, which will, this, this, characteris this characteristic we'll use, uh, on the, we'll use on the next slide when we talk about the exit plan. Normally, when we design the architecture of the new system, uh, we need to design a new system or we need to design migration to the public, to the public cloud. We need to use, we, we have dozens, dozens of requirements, non-functional and functional requirements. In case of regulated environment, financial institution, European Union, we have additional sources of requirements from the guidelines, from the authorities. The first is uh, risk analysis, risk assessment. As the output of risk assessment, we, we got a risk which we need to mitigate by proper design, by proper design of application, by proper design of infrastructure. Uh, risk analysis, let's imagine this is a very big Excel with a lot of rows, and every row is connected, with, for example, with uh, with some risk, with some characteristic with, uh, of, of the system. For example, thanks to this risk assessment, we know that the system will uh, process legally protected data. So if it's legally protected data, we need to encrypt the data using customer managed key. And you need to have exit plan uh, for this data and for the system. Uh, good, to, good to have during this designing of the system, and another source, of course, another source of the requirements, non-functional requirements, is to have exit plan, of course. Good to have uh, during the initial phase, business owner of the system, business owner of this domain, because we can, together with the business owner and together with the risk analysis, we can determine which functionality, functionality of the system are critical and important. So to simplify, thanks to it, we know which part of the system we need to have exit plan, because we need to have exit plan only for important and critical function. And the exit plan must be, of course, easy to carry out, because it will be repeated one in a while, and it, it is additional cost for us, for, for IT company, for IT, IT department. Uh, and the char characteristic of microservices are very helpful to achieving this plan. Because we, we, we know that for this system, we, we need to have exit plan, but not for everything, not every part of the system. Microservices built from the set, from the domains, from the boundary context, from the set of the, uh, if you're using the domain-driven design, of course, pattern, you have set of, uh, Set of, set of microservices, and we split the problem of having exit plan to, to domain level. And next, we can split this problem on microservice level. So we split the big problem to smaller problems. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it is easier to resolve the problem, small problem about on the microservice level to have exit plan, how we, what is the exit plan, how we can execute the exit plan for on the microservice level. Uh, so to, under, to, 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 or to, I like simplifying things. So to undersimplify, let's say for microservices uh, that implement critical functionality. Thanks to that we have domain-driven design, we have the boundary context, we can find which microservice, which, which collection of microservices are important for us, for, is critical. So for, for this microservice, this microservice should be cloud agnostic. That's it. For rest of them, we can think about if we need it or we don't need it in the, after we uh, execute the exit plan. That's why I recommend to use a feature toggles pattern uh, to, to, to switch off functionality which are not important and we don't have exit plan for them. Thanks to we control, in control way, we can uh, switch off this functionality and migrate the system to uh, 
migrates the system to another cloud provider or migrate to the on-premise. Another uh, pattern which can use is circuit breaker. Thanks to it, we improve the resiliency of the whole system of, from the individual failures of the service. Microservice in nature, microservice architecture is that one, if one service go down, the system should work, but without some part of the system. The system should work uh, properly in general way, but before, without some, some part of the system, without some, some functionality. So this is, let's imagine that this is the, this is the um, exit plan. We switch off part of the system because we can, because it's microservices. Uh, this is the same, so, the same what Chaos Monkeys does. Chaos Monkey switch terminates some pods, terminates services, and they check that if the system goes down or not, whole system. So uh, I think this, these three patterns, Chaos Monkey, Circuit Breaker, and Future Toggles is very useful uh, for, for this case, for cloud native, uh, for, for example, for uh, using in financial institution when we have to exit plan, which are cheap, we are easy to execute. And another advantage of this is that you can use cloud specific features. For example, you can use a speech to text feature from the, for example, GCP cloud, and you can switch off this feature when we execute the exit plan. Uh, thanks to thanks to it, you can use the, this cloud-specific features, ready-to-use ready to services. You can decrease the uh, time to market. You can improve quality of services. Uh, but if you, of course, you need, to, uh, you need to verify this idea with the business owners, which is important, which function is important, or which not, is, which isn't important. All right. This is about the architecture of the uh, of the application. Now we should some, somewhere build infrastructure. We need to build, uh, build infrastructure when we, where we run this application. Uh, for us, it's important to use one common way to build infrastructure in different clouds. And the most important things is to use declarative and immutable way of building infrastructure. So using infrastructure, infrastructure as a code is the key, I think, here. Uh, because thanks to, thanks to this that we, we have the infrastructure as a code, we can, uh, we can basing on this, we can, create, uh, we can create infrastructure in other cloud uh, and execute the exit plan because we need to test it. Uh, I think the, the most popular tools to do it is the Terraform. Uh, and thanks to Terraform, we have one tool and one language. It's not language, but we have one language which we, where we can build infrastructure and deploy in different clouds. Another part, another element of, of this reference is uh, we have the application, but we need to run on something, on runtime. We need to choose the runtime. The best runtime, which is cloud agnostic, common uh, in cloud, public, private, and hybrid, is container runtime. It's a simple answer. We should use container D or Docker to run, to, to create image containers, which are um, independent from, from the place where we run. So we have the same image container. We can easily run this on the one cloud and easily run to another cloud. Uh, Thanks to it, we reduce the time of the executing the exit plan, of testing the exit plan. Another part, of course, is orchestration management because we have the container, we have the infrastructure. We need to run. We need to some somebody. We need to something which orchestrate and manage on our container. Is Kubernetes is another simple answer. Uh, Kubernetes is very common, and is very common, and this and uh, is available in every public cloud. Is you, and you can deploy 
uh, Kubernetes on private cloud on bare metal. Uh, and, but there is something we need to, to check because not every distribution of Kubernetes are the same. So we need to check if this distribution is, this distribution is certified. So CNCF is another place where CNCF help us is uh, they certified distribution of Kubernetes. Currently we have more than 90, 90 certified distribution of, of Kubernetes, which we can use, uh, Thanks to it, we can use almost on the same uh, on the same way uh, across the providers. Across the providers, thanks to this certification, we have consistency of API, consistency of vers versioning uh, of the Kubernetes, and configurability. Observability. We cannot forget about the observability. Observability is the base fundament of running microservice in the, running microservice and in the cloud native. Uh, when we think about the multi-cloud approach and thinking about the exit plan, and thinking about the regulatory environments, we should find the common set of tools of observability which can use independent on the places. So um, we are recommended to use the Prometheus, Victoria Metrics, Wendy, and thanks to it, our monitoring teams, they can use the same tools, they can use the same alerts across the providers, across the cloud. Uh, another part is provisioning of application. Provisioning application, provisioning conf configuration to the cluster, to the Kubernetes cluster. We have we have two good tools. So we have Flux and Argo CD, which can use. And thanks to these tools, uh, de declarative tools, uh, according, uh, which are compliant with Open Git Tops principles, we can, easy to you can easily deploy uh, to one cloud, another cloud, and executing the exit plan, because the process of provisioning will be the same. So the exec execution of the exit plan will be standard standard deployment as standard deployment will be standard deployment so the, there is nothing special there, there will be nothing special for the in the case of exit ex, uh, testing the exit plan we can use the same tools uh, the same process and we migrate for example uh, airbag roles from one kubernetes to another kubernetes we create we can easily deploy namespaces and so on um, I've, for now, it's, uh, that's it. Uh, I'm faster than I think so. So I open to the question. Some questions? Hmm? Uh, I also work at a bank. Mm -hmm. Multi-cloud. Cloud stuff. And um, how have you sort of... Okay. Excuse me. Oh. Mic check, one, two, one, two. Hi, everyone. <laughs> um, sorry, yeah, my question was the... Um, yeah, so I work uh, also at a bank, and we do very similar stuff. So, and it, we find it really good, but we don't do multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested into the uh, advantages that you found of multi-cloud stuff um, and how easy you found working with like a lot of the Terraform infrastructure and things trying to build with multi-cloud, essentially, uh, over just dealing with a single provider. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's Interesting question. I think the, the, the biggest advantage is that if we have the multi-cloud, we can use specific features of the cloud. What is the best on the public cloud? In GCP, we have, for example, speech for text is the best. Maybe. I don't know. Uh, in AWS, we have serverless. In, in Azure, we have, for example, uh, uh, pass service for, uh, for data warehousing, for example. And thanks to the multi-cloud, thanks to Terraform, uh, 
uh, we had the common things and thanks to this approach that we we need to find the border between what we have, what we need to be cloud agnostic, what not, we can use it. Yeah. Cool. So it's not necessarily that you're deploying like Kubernetes on every platform and deploying all the services yeah. and all the databases and everything. It's more that you're like picking and choosing what's going to be the best for whatever you're building. Exactly. Sweet. Thanks. Mm -hmm. That was my only question. Thanks. What are your thoughts around the sprawl of tool sets that we're seeing within financial customers? So if you just think about the kind of basic automation, like you've got Ansible, Chef, Terraform, Salt, that's out there. Then you start to lay on, you said, choose your own like kind of observability tools. There's lots of them out there. And each kind of silo team starts to bring their own. Mm -hmm. And the APIs make it easy for them to integrate their own. But everyone's creating their own mini snowflakes. And if you know main players within each team's leave, you're struggling to support it after that. Mm. Hard question. <laughs> mm. Ansible is, is all right, but it's cast, this is configuration management system. Uh, I, I don't like it because it's not declarative. It's not immutable. So we try to not using something like that. Because, because it's, immu it's, it's mutable and it's not declarative, so it's hard to, to switch to another cloud. Uh, you need to rewrite every Every, all the process in the playbooks and so on. But I think we'll, we'll have this at, in the future because these are very good tools. Um, but we try to not using these, these tools because we need to be, as, as we can, to be agnostic and have, keep everything in the code. And automation is the, like in the development, we have API first approach. Here, we should have automation first approach yeah. uh, and declarative uh, according to open GitOps principle. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question as well. Uh, I work also in the financial industry and uh, I would be curious to know mm -hmm. how you're ensuring that uh, the compliance uh, definitions are met in, uh, in, in your Kubernetes environments. How are you reporting on that one? Normally you have a long list and uh, need to provide that. Uh, I have. I think uh, I have the risk analysis, and we have the risk which we need to mitigate. If we mitigate this risk, the risk the the, uh, the risk will be low. So this is the for us. Uh, um, this is what we need to achieve: that the low risk of the risk from the risk assessment. You don't have any real-time reporting on that one. Real-time reporting. Uh, no, no, no. Thank you. No, not yet. Um, the, the question I had was for risk assessment. Um, mm -hmm. The risk assessments that you do um, is, do you keep that, do you do them with a specific compliance framework in mind? Um, and then yeah. question number two, um, how do you do the risk assessment? Does, do you have a risk registry that you maintain um, you know, throughout the bank? And then is that, um, is that expressed in some sort of uh, machine readable format like OSCAL? Um, Both the risk assessment, we, have, we, do it, we don't need together, uh, uh, we done according to ESO, Something I don't I'm not the expert in this, but according to some framework to risk assessment, uh, we have the of, of course we have the teams compliance teams which and security team they provide for us this assessment. We this is uh, uh, quite complex things because uh, we need to uh, we need to um, cooperate with several teams in the banks so yeah. compliance security IT legal and so on because we need to analyze even contract not only from technical but from the contract point of view yeah. uh, thank you i have a question uh what is your cloud maturity um and how much do you have your products in the cloud in this multi-cloud system and how many 
like what is your uh, development team and operations team or cloud teams there are? What is the team size? Um, and the last question, sorry, there's so many. Uh, last question is, there must be also a lot of these cloud-specific infrastructure resources that are maybe not so easy to manage with your Terraform scripts and so on. How do you do that? All right. Uh, <laughs> I'll take All right. Uh, currently, in the MBank, we are building landing zone in, in two cloud providers. And we have several applications in the one cloud. And we have several applications in the cloud, private cloud. And we try to, and we are building application ag in agnostic way that we can deploy application to the public cloud and the private cloud on the, using the same tools, using the same, the same way. That's why the, we're using the observability is the same, the same we are using the same tools. Uh, I don't know how many developers we have, but I think it's 600. 600. 600 developers. It's quite a big uh, company. In my previous, uh, I worked before bank, I worked for insurance companies, the same regulation we have. And we have application in the multi-cloud, in, in GCP and uh, Azure. And we set up everything from Terraform. Uh, but, uh, but Terraform is different. The script is different than cloud. <laughs> there is not, this only tool is the same. Uh, about the Cloud Center of Excellence, the team has uh, seven, seven person, it's cross-discipline person, cross-discipline members, uh, and we have dedicated team for uh, compliance team, which they handle the contract things, uh, risk assessment, risk subjects, and so on. It's, uh, I think it's maybe 20 person is involved in this. <laughs> Hey, during your talk, you mentioned uh, data location and data processing mm -hmm. topic. How do you resolve it? Because it's, uh, usually it's very governed regulations and it can be dynamic. Do you have specific tools or just for each case you create something mm -hmm. proprietary? Uh, it's, we are using a lot of uh, policy. Uh, this, work, this works? A lot of policy. Uh, for example, uh, in Azure policy, we have policy that we need to, we, disable, we can set up the resources only in two regions, for the North Europe and West Europe. That's why we, we, uh, we are sure that we're using only this region uh, in, the, in the cloud by policy. Thank you. Um, what are your thoughts on service mesh as a way to secure the workloads in your clusters in runtime? Yeah. We, the next, next, uh, the next subject, the next uh, phase of our development will be using this of, uh, open service mesh, because thanks to it we can, uh, we will have always we have encryption in transit always because without the open service mesh it's hard to, to achieve in the cluster in the encryption uh, encryption traffic between the pods so we, we implement this phase the next of music open source so thank you very much uh, thank you